Hello, hello, and welcome to a special edition of the Yogi's podcast. This is a in the studio podcast, um, one I'm really excited about today. Uh, we've got Manny as the co-host today. Hello, Manny Geese. Manny Geese. And then we've also got our guest for today, who is Callum Clark, uh, ex-pro rugby player, played for Saracens, Northampton, Yorkshire, and England as well. And now heads up player development and wellness at Saracens. So, Callum, welcome. Thank you for being here. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Got to be here. Yeah. Callum actually ran um, the Yorkshire Dales Marathon on Saturday. So he's, yeah, he's doing well to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you want to start just telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and who you are? Um, yeah, I'd had just finished my uh, playing career um like you say it was a, a couple of different teams um finished up at Saracens in summer of last year um been sort of studying psychology for a number of years now towards the end of my career to kind of with a view to transitioning into that when I finished and um yeah that's the kind of role I've gone into um working with sort of the the, the players at Saracens on that mm-hmm. side of things um it's becoming a bigger and bigger interest mm-hmm. and passion really in my life um and sort of again I also sparked a lot by sort of my experience as a player and um yeah it's kind of uh, really been interesting and and a and a good transition out of of playing yeah because we've had some interesting conversations about what the reality is of elite sport and you know the picture that we all have well a lot of us have in our head and the actual reality of it is really different. And I think some of the, you know, we only think about and see the good side. And some of the conversations we've had have been really interesting about what it's actually like, the sacrifices and, and, you know, now taking that into your new role now and the experience that you've had throughout your career, actually guiding, laying the kind of what it's like for the next generation, the new people coming into the game sounds, sounds like it's needed um, from, from how we've talked as well. So Manny, should we start with the question? Do you want to ask the question? Oh, this is a very hard question. <laughs> you ready, Kyle? I think there might need to be eye contact for the question. <laughs> the question is this. What's your problem, mate? Uh, today, my problem is my legs after uh, <laughs> after the marathon on Saturday. But yeah, I think um, more broadly, I think what I'm thinking and, and sort of yeah worrying a lot about is sort of transitioning out of uh being a professional athlete and into kind of a new role a new life uh a new sort of professional identity um and all the big changes that that come with that sort of socially um financially yeah. uh there's a lot of change and a lot of shift and um yeah it feels like a big transitional period almost like a, a death of one mm-hmm. and and a and a rebirth of another so um it's been it's been challenging uh but i feel like uh slowly making steps forward into kind of a new and uh, actually more exciting uh yeah life and identity so that's that's my problem at the moment yeah and and do you feel that cause you talked about identity do you feel like it is almost a new identity you have to create because you had you know old, old Callum and you're not even that old as well <laughs> but like old, old Callum that was professional rugby player and now you've moved away from that and into your new role do, do you feel like it is a new identity that you're kind of learn or new things that you're learning about yourself now that you've moved out of what you were doing previously that have yeah have created this new identity for you yeah I think I think I didn't really realize it as a player but I think my identity was so ingrained solely in performance and in succeeding as a rugby player. Um, and I put every, all my eggs in that basket. So whenever there was injury or I wasn't selected, and then particularly as my career started to decline towards the end and started to become clear that it was the end was coming, um, the sense of sort of loss and confusion and struggle that came with those moments um, was pretty profound and, and difficult, you know. 
um, because I'd put all the eggs in that basket mm. um, and I had what felt like very little added aspects to me, if that makes sense, or other, other sort of senses of self. And I think that um, that's something I try and work with players now is to develop well, sort of as as I sort of came to the end of my career and studied psychology, that then became this held like this other part of me that then, you know, kind of has helped me really through and into the sort of next transition. I I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have like mm. that sort of bubbling along on the side. And that's something that I think Saracens is in particular, but also the work I'm doing is trying to get these young athletes to develop things outside of themselves and that can be in relationships so you know whether it's you know good supportive relationships with friends family um that's your sort of relational self and then this personal self like what do I like what do I want to do well if I wasn't a player who were, you know what would I like to spend my life doing so that um it's not all pinned on mm. success or failure as a rugby player because that that can come and go and it can be fleeting and things can get taken from you with injury and things like that. So, um, and if you fall from that, it, it can be pretty difficult. So, um, try and have other things to, um, support them if, if that's not going so well. Yeah. yeah. So, Cause I guess the life of a elite sportsman is in most sports, at least apart from maybe golf is, is short, mm. you know, it, it must fly by. And did you, before you know in the in the few I guess you started doing getting into psychology and and doing your studies but was that a conscious decision that you made when you were maybe a few years away from retirement and kind of when you said that your career was was kind of slowing down Mm -hmm. did you make a conscious decision to do that or did that happen by chance um I think I've been helped a lot on the way and and so kind of the the path of of my career was kind of was building up building up had a few good scenes at Northampton and we we managed to win a a premiership and I managed to get um capped for for my country uh, and got and and that was kind of the peak really Mm -hmm. and um I had an injury shortly after I got capped and then like when I actually stepped back from it now that was the beginning of the end really like the slow decline started there but I was only 26 at that point um and then I had kind of, I moved to Saracens and felt like I had a bit of a, a lift and thought, okay, this is like a chance to, to go again. Um, cause I'd sort of two years after, after that, where I, I struggled with injury and this, that, and the other, um, made the move and then it kind of slowly, um, faded out and fizzled away. And, and it was me, when I moved to Saracens, they had a psychologist as part of the club or, or someone who was psychologically trained yeah. and meeting him he could see that I was struggling mm. where, and, and he was the one who sort of said to me, like he, he just got a sense that it might be helpful for me to so, read a few books or do this or do that. So the injuries you was having, was this the same injuries or different type of injuries? Um, yeah, I had, I had a big injury after I got capped that kept me out for a, a year, I had a number of surgeries on that, but then I also had a back injury that was like, consistent Mm -hmm. and that was just so that was another part that was difficult and the reality of sport like you're saying before is constantly in pain every single day and and to get through the training ah every day every day um and like you're you're going into a tuesday training so so mondays are quite sort of like not as high intensity but tuesdays are, are like as close as you'll get to a game outside of training so and just I just remember going in for those Tuesdays, just dreading it. And mm. um, I, I, but when I was at Saracens, I wasn't performing to a level. I, I wasn't physically capable of performing at a level to be selected in in the team consistently. Um, I just I just wasn't. Um, so <laughs> then you're training in the sort of second team holding the pads, trying to prepare the first team and still just my, my body was just giving out on me. So, um, yeah, the last few years were, were a struggle. Um, yeah, but, but so to the, the psychologist then spotted and said, oh, why don't you study this? And then it was kind of thought, yeah, I better get moving on what I want to do next. So I guess it started out as a bit of a curiosity thing. Um, 
and then has developed now into kind of okay this is what I want my profession to be um, for yeah as I move into the future and yeah. and you talk about when you started holding pads for the first team so I remember when we were speaking to Kevin who was a ex-footballer he was saying that thing of in in training you're, you're constantly judged you know it's like if if I think about my job or other people's jobs it's almost like every day in training you're judged you're looked at the coaches are looking at you how how did that how was that for you in terms of the pressure that put on you is that something that is true and you kind of felt that every day you're being judged or every week it's like I've got to perform every training session I've got to show that I need to be picked I'm the one what is that actually like yeah I, I think there's there's different even within a rugby squad there's different groups of players so at Northampton I was very fortunate to be sort of in the in a considered as someone if I was fit and I was well I'd, I'd, I'd usually play so you sort of you've got that sense of belonging and 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 you sort of know that you're going to be involved in the team at the weekend and that's one group of players and that's the sort of like you you sort of nailed on starters and you're you, you're better players um, and then because of obviously you need a big squad um, and then sorry then you have the sort of academy guys who come in and they're training up to to, to make it so they're not often, unless they're exceptional, in that top group. And you have the kind of middle group who are your squad players that you need. Um, you need them to for numbers to train against. You need them if there's injuries. And that's to be in that group in particular, I found incredibly challenging. And that's why I was at Saracens, because if you're in that top group, then the feeling of judgment and criticism, I don't think is as harsh, because you kind of have that sense of... But, you know, if I'm fit and I'm playing well, I'm in. But in that middle group, it's kind of like I have to be exceptional every single day to even get a chance of being um, involved. And that's not to say those guys at the top, that they're still extremely high performing, but it's more the sense of like, just uh, the difference in being at Northampton and feeling that sense of like groundedness, going to Saracens and then quickly realising I wasn't good enough to be in the top group. And the stress and the anxiety and the struggle that came with that. And for, for good reasons, you know, I wasn't good enough, as I say, and, and Saracens were performing better at the time. And so I had moved up in terms of expectation. Um, but yeah, that, that was a, a real difficult challenge to face. And I think that's one of the big um, areas of growth is, is how you deal with that group. And make them, or try and cultivate that sense of belonging when they're not in the team, and, and respect the level of anxiety they're going to feel. Because there's also things like if you're in that group, well, am I going to get another contract? Because I'm not really playing. Like, am I in the shop window for anyone else? Because what do people outside think who might have signed? You know, like there's all that sort of stuff, job insecurity, these types of things. So, uh, yeah, my, my experience of being in that group at Saracens was was tough in it and coming towards the end and everything like that so but it definitely taught me a lot as well yeah. um so it was valuable yeah. ultimately and because i think as men as well something that a lot of people question at different parts of their life career relationships is that thing you're saying am i enough am i good enough and i think it's it's really hard to sometimes just be kind to ourselves because i think when we get into that am i good enough that creates these negative cycles that I, I've definitely had in my life and I think a lot of people have. And when you're in one of those, let's call it a cycle of am I enough, am I good enough, how does that manifest? Like, how did that manifest for you? Did that lead you to do certain things, act in a certain way? Or, or kind of how did it manifest, do you think, and how you were feeling as well? Yeah, because I, I, I'd probably was facing up to feelings that, um, I hadn't necessarily had to face up before because I think when I was say when I was at Northampton maybe had a bit more of a surer sense of where I sat mm. um, I didn't necessarily feel or ask that question as much am I enough but then when I moved and I'd kind of the you know I was saying before about the professional identity once that was a bit shaky and I didn't realise I didn't really have anything else to me then uh, that question started really rearing its head and that feeling of like, well, this isn't working out and this is all I am. So 
what what you know the, all those that real deep sort of worry and concern and um questioning and and it definitely coping with that you know definitely made some decisions i wish i hadn't you know like um kind of just not not very healthy ways of coping going out too much and um you know numbing it with alcohol or whatever different different and and I'd you know thankfully I don't think I ever really went down any one route too deep where it got super problem problematic. I think I always managed to kind of pull myself back before it got really bad, and I was getting therapy and help and these types of things. So there were it wasn't all bad coping, but there were definitely like slippery slopes that I could have ended up like going down if if um, you know I hadn't had sort of good support and and equally like I say this. Um, finding this new passion with the psychology stuff like that yeah. was, you know, like that helped me avoid probably really getting. So, into um, so when, you, when you're going through this process or this experience, did you have like good family support? Um, I probably kept most of it to myself, met partly because maybe I didn't wasn't didn't really realise what was going on, mm-hmm. and I'm just caught in the middle of it, going like, how do I cope? Like, I feel terrible. I don't know if I'm valued at work and I don't really know who else I am. So what do I do? Like, you got attention from your family because obviously you're this guy playing for this big team. Mm. So, yeah. I th- And I think with, like what we were saying before, there's an expectation as an athlete, a professional athlete, that yeah. you're living the dream. Yeah. And like you're, I don't want to over, overplay that by the way, but like, you know, there's this expectation that like everything's good. Um, so the I thought the problem must be with me because like all right, if everyone out there thinks it's great, yeah. then and I'm feeling terrible then right, there must be something to fix in here. And actually I think the more I learn and speak to people and and now work in the in like the more normalised it's become and actually healthier ways out and healthier avenues of coping would have been um available i just didn't I, I didn't know what to do at the time so just was doing what I, what, I, what i could to to get through it i think yeah. yeah what about teammates is that something you could chat to teammates about or is that i, th- I think i, th- I again I, I just it's probably not come that naturally to me to reach out particularly not to my teammates or friends um so i, I did internalize a lot of it and like i said um I just assumed the problem was like, it was something I needed to do better or do different rather than actually I'm going through something quite normal that's quite difficult and it doesn't make you feel great. Um, so like normalising that emotion for myself and others. Um, yeah, so um, most of it I just tried to sort of soldier on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think if I hadn't had the, the various like bits of help and outlets and support yeah. Um, yeah, it could have been a lot worse, potentially. And, yeah. you know, rugby is an extremely macho sport. You know, it's one of the toughest sports in the world. And is there a culture, what is a dressing room culture around, not like, you know, happy, clappy, sharing feelings, but if, if you were to some, you know, say, you know, I'm having a bit of a shit day, this, you know, I've, is there that culture in the dressing room of, that is acceptable or, or is it something that you think would be laughed at or kind of looked down or are there some people that you might be able to speak about it or yeah what is that you know what is the culture like of of that i think we we are trying to really progress what's going on with that stuff um uh, it, sorry i say that stuff but like those types of conversations and the the discourses around this stuff and then how it's dealt with um, and that's kind of my role a little bit at the moment is is how do we actually approach this? Because what I also think is important is um, is to try not to pathologize everything mm. and to and to normalize what what goes on. Like like we were talking before about what is a normal experience of being a professional rugby player? Yeah. A lot of pain, a lot of boredom. You do the same things over and over and over again. It's tough you're in a competitive difficult environment like it's it's um it's challenging 
and I think we need to normalise that and people need support and help with that and bad days, good days. Mm. It's all part of part of it. Um, and that the conversation just is normal in that sense. Um, I think the culture at the minute, it's still finding its feet in terms of how to deal with people's minds and emotions. Um, it's. It, I think everyone knows it's important. Everyone wants to try and progress how it's dealt with but I don't know if it's currently been done particularly well there's definitely room to grow and I, I feel like that's in a way I feel like that's part of what I, I want to do with yeah, with my yeah. career and my, my life really now is is to really push that forward and to normalize these things and to respect that the these people aren't um people with a body and and the robots to be programmed they're human beings with with lots of different aspects of themselves and mind and emotions body um and that and actually in turning to that and and seeing their humanity and seeing these aspects of them you open a lot of doors to even higher levels of performance and mm -hmm. functioning and like um and i think that's what i hope to to start to move towards because if you think it's very robotic and all right you're just a piece of meat then they're going to play yeah. like a piece of meat yeah, yeah, whereas yeah, if you yeah. open up this this side of well yeah there's there's emotion there there's there's feeling there's there's motivation there's drive there's hunger there's desire like all these things you want on a good day but you don't want to deal with the the pain and the anxiety and the struggle and the suffering oh, we don't want that yeah. So then how can you, you know, it's like, why do you think you can have that with that? It comes from the same pool of resources, like you're a human being. Yeah. And I think to di if we want to fully maximise the best of people, we have to figure out a way of healthily dealing with and embracing difficult parts of like life uh, and careers and stuff like that. So, um yeah, that that's kind of what I, f I feel like the the direction I would like to take it in. And I think that point about you know saying pieces of me and actually treating people like people is 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 really important. I think as a fan, as someone who watched rugby and football, I think I kind of, especially with kind of people I absolutely love, like I'm a big Arsenal fan. Someone like Saka, I kind of look at him like this guy is a you know. A hero, I absolutely love him. You know, he's about ten years younger than me. <laughs> he's about ten years younger than me that I look up to him like almost like a god. But and, but it's still that thing as fans as well. It's really hard to view elite sportsmen as human and try and understand them on that human level because I think you know the things that we were talking about. You know, we see the good thing, and you're saying you know it's the matches that we see. It's scoring a try. It's scoring a goal. It's those moments that I imagine are just unbelievable walking out to a full stadium or scoring a try or scoring. That must be, you know, the massive, massive high moments. We don't see any of the low moments and the realities. And you're kind of talking about it before the pain every day, the boredom. Yeah. What, what is, you know, as, as non elite sportsmen, what, and for a lot of the essence, what is it actually like? I think I, I can only sp well, speak of my experience in the research and studies I've done, but like the, the big challenges of like selection, mm -hmm. am I picked this week? Am I not picked? Um, you know, it, it, that happens on a Monday. Like, like it happens on a Monday. You'll yeah, know so, for the week. Yeah. So, so on a Monday and you're sort of walking in, well, in, in the sort of position I was in, you're sort of walking in like, and it's, it's almost like, am I, am I worthy today? Did, mm -hmm. Like, and I, in a sort of like more, in a bigger sense, like obviously the coach is just picking the team for the weekend. But for you personally, it's like, do I have value in this world today or not? Mm -hmm. But if you, if if you're so invested in you know, like being an athlete, um, so like you've got that challenge going on, and then but like training can be so boring and repetitive. Mm -hmm. um, the anxiety of like a game. Um, what's going to happen this weekend? Am I going to perform well enough? Um, and, and maybe, you know, I'm just speaking from my experience here. Like, you know, I wouldn't want to say that's indicative of everyone else's. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, like training can be very repetitive, especially if you do it year on year, year in, year out, even sort of like not every game sort of feels like a big deal once you're, you've really? played a lot of them. Um, and, and you, you try and treat it as such, like you try and, you know, you're a professional, but it's, it's not always, doesn't always feel as special as maybe, um, you'd think from the outside. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it's, and then there are obviously good things about it. Um, actually another thing is, is like, I'd say it's quite lonely at times. Mm. Like, um, since I've retired now and, and feel like I've got a little bit of space and room to live my life a little bit more. And now we, you know, I've got different groups of friends and you can go out with them and do different things that you were never able to do. I'm like, whoa, like people in life do this. Like people go and like, <laughs> it's like. What, what's like one of the things that you were just like, what people do this? Yeah, no, what I, I, like go, I, 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 I like my music and like, yeah. I love going to like events or nice. these types of things. And like, I don't know, like <laughs> going to, I don't know, something on at Printworks and you're in the, yeah. like, oh, oh, oh there's like thousands of people here doing We're this. Like, yeah. yeah, and you're like, you're just going, I never thought this was a thing because yeah. because when would you go and like for 10 hours during the day and watch DJs play? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. That's how some people stay fit. Yeah, yeah. 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 You I've, think, I've been to the Printworks. Yeah, 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 it's good, man. It's yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so here's the thing. So, which is more important to teach the young kids coming up? Enjoy the game or try to be the best in the game? Because it seems like a lot of people go through this process of being sportsmen and they don't really enjoy the time. Yeah. Because most of it is competition every day. Like you said, every Monday is like, am I starting? Yeah, yeah. It's like starting every week from scratch. Yeah. It's pretty hard. I, I think we have a, a real responsibility to coach and teach and in, in a way where both things are possible, yeah. where players p like find a joy in performing at a high level. Yeah. And, um, and in almost like it doesn't have to be uh, either or, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Um, but in order to do that, I think we have to approach it in a different way. Um, and I think, yeah. Because after all, you are in the game because you love the game. You're a rugby player because you wanted to be a rugby player. So this sort of this, you started with love already. How was that though, at the beginning when it went from a game that you loved to I might actually have a career? What yeah. was that transition like? When we, when did, was there a moment when you thought, okay, actually, I'm going to make a career out of this? If, I, if I'm completely honest, I don't know if I ever loved the game. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I read that. Yeah, I, I have to be honest. Like, I think rugby for me was a place in my life to express it, like to just let all my emotions out. Yeah. Um, because you're a big guy. And you yeah, I, I could just like. And, and I was, you know, I was pretty ill-disciplined on the pitch, like, because yeah. it was like my whole, it was just somewhere to be able to express emotions I needed to let out and, and um, you know, be physical, be aggressive. Um, and then as I sort of got older and just went through, it was like, oh, you're actually all right at this game. And then just all kind of, all right, yeah. you know, yeah. played for England. <laughs> <laughs> but just kind of like, I didn't even make the choice to be, I never thought as a kid, oh, I, can't, I would love to be a professional rugby player. I just kind of like, got was working, sort of working up through academies and this and that, getting picked for different teams. And then like, oh, you'll get a professional contract when you, when you leave school and go to university. I was like, oh, sweet. Yeah, do that. And it just kind of went from there. Um, yeah, I actually probably loved like playing football more because there was less pressure. I wasn't very good, but like I enjoyed playing it like with my mates. My United fan. Nah, Newcastle. <laughs> Two. Yeah, yeah. Times. Yeah, we're coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that that thing, like I loved playing football just because it was with your mates mm. and there was no pressure. 
And I remember like if I had a football match at school or whatever, I, cu- I couldn't wait till school finished, go and play football. If it was a rugby match, I would dread it because it was like, at the pressures on me, I've got to perform. I'm assuming at school that's because you were, you know, the, yeah, the best player as well. Uh, and there was that added pressure. Yeah. I guess like from a young age, you're sort of putting the team on your shoulders maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But that that's when I actually look back at it, it's kind of interesting that mm. and whether, you know, whether I'd have played more for the love of it and, and just played football at a you know it terrible like? level. It sounds like physicality <laughs> met opportunity. Because you was this giant of a man, you know, <laughs> and obviously, why not? Why not try rugby? Yeah, yeah. I th- and my dad played, and yeah. it, it was kind of a natural thing just to keep rolling with it. You know, it was going well. So, like, all right, I'll do this, and then, oh yeah. Oh, yeah cool. Well, like you say, on the outside, it is yeah. the dream, and when you're younger as well, I'm great. <laughs> yeah, you know, like- and and yeah, it's just not the way it works. Like, mm. it's just not how it works. Um, yeah. But I did just kind of like roll with it with the opportunity, like you say. Yeah. And and the physicality side of the game, um, you know, obviously you, you had a bit of a reputation. You, you had uh, the incident where you got, at the time, <laughs> the the biggest ban, I think it was at the time, I think 32 weeks. And I guess when we talk about a career full of highs and lows, that being one of the moments that I imagine was, was one of the lows. And I guess one interested to know how you felt not as soon as you did it but in the kind of the days after that how you actually felt and also how you then dealt with having a ban and what all that meant and all the kind of yeah I guess mentally and emotionally what state that put you in I mean it's obviously like a hugely disappointing moment in my career um it's yeah something that um took a long time to work through, I guess, and understand. And yeah, still probably something I think about, you know, um, yeah, from time to time. Um, and, you know, to try and have learned from it and use it and to move, to try and, help others avoid making similar mistakes and um is is big you know a big part of what I'm what I'm trying to do um but it was it was a difficult time um obviously it was the the lowest and most difficult thing and part of my career um i think it's always been um something that's been followed me in, in rugby as as you'd expect, like, you know, um to to have that as as a part of your past and have to accept it and um try and use it to and I think I, I think although it was difficult, um it's definitely enriched me to do what I do now and sitting down with players who might be going through the ups and downs and they know that I've been through it. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just, you know, like been properly through the mill and you sort of, um, yeah, there's a great quote I like and it's, you can only take others as far as you've been yourself. And I think Mm. Mm. that's where I look at what I've been through and go, well, there's something I can take from it As, as terrible and difficult and shameful and, as it was, there's something in it and that's, I have to walk forward with that, I think. Mm. But it, it, interestingly, like when I actually look back at it from, and having studied now, it was all to do with emotion. Like it was mm. all an inability and lack of ability to acknowledge, process, deal with my own emotions. And they used to come out on the pitch in unhealthy outburst type of ways. I just suppress, suppress, suppress. Uh, don't feel anything yet, blah, blah, blah. And then it comes out in like release. A, a release moment, which is just so, you know, it's almost like you're a different person. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it, and, and that's where I think, you know, helping players to deal more healthily with their emotions, to acknowledge it, to have language for it, to use them, to own them, to recognize them. Um, I think we avoid a lot of those 
those problems mm-hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that sorry if i kind of caught you out with that but i really appreciate the the honesty and and kind of what you said there um and it is really interesting to what you're saying about that quote you said and about the experience you have from that and what that has meant for being able to work with with young young professionals as well in terms of the best thing about playing professional rugby what do you think were the whether it be particular highlights or kind of what was the best thing about being a professional rugby player i've realized i've been pretty damning on on it but (laughs) there are there are good moments i mean the elation of like winning the premiership um you know being part of teams that 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 win tough difficult games yeah um Managed to win one at Northampton, then moved to Saracens, and we won a couple there. Oh, wow. Um, one yeah, well, yeah. My first as a staff member, but yeah, and then, and then just just that feeling of getting over the line, and and like the sort of external validation for all the sacrifice, hard work, effort mm-hmm. that had gone in. Um, they're amazing, and when it, Northampton's a big rugby town, um, and you know the the club in Northampton's well followed. The football club's not huge, so mm-hmm. rugby club's the the main thing. And just I, I remember we um, we'd lost the final the year before, so there was a lot of like hurt and and sort of built up pain, and then we managed to win in like the hundredth minute extra time. Last minute try, um, bit contentious against Saracens actually. <laughs> so yeah, bit contentious, and it was kind of like it was such an amazing euphoric like moment. Uh, and then we came back to Northampton, and the next day we oh, I came back when I was living in a house with like a few of the teammates at the time, and some people in the village had like decorated the front of our house like wow. champions and all that yes. and stuff like that. When that was really like a special when you look back um and then we had like a open bus tour around the town wow. so we jumped on the bus at the stadium and i was like what are we doing no one's gonna turn up like <laughs> it's it's like you've just you know we're not like um and, you were surprised, yeah. and we went into town and and because it's a big rugby town yeah there, were, there was a, an amazing turnout and people have been i didn't actually realize this but people with northampton never won the top flight but they've been a club playing in the top flight for a long long time mm. So um, for them to win, it was a big deal. And to be involved in that was was amazing. Um, yeah, so the, I think moments like that are in, incredible. And the moments where you played in a big game, you feel like you've played well, you've come through some tough times, you've done it with people you, you care about and you're invested in and, the, the, and you know, their special moments, the deeper, mm. like, relationships and stuff like that. Um. So yeah, that the 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 special things about it. Yeah, Saracens. I did that in Man United of like ro- um, of rugby. Like. <laughs> um, we've had it. We've had a really, <laughs> we've had a really successful like ten years. Yeah. Um, and then we had like we got in trouble with the salary cap. Um, okay. and then we had like a relegation a year in the championship, and now we're back up in the Premiership. So that ten years, they I think. I don't know how many Is it titles they won. With you guys or something? Yeah. Harlequins won last year. Yeah. yeah. And then we beat them in the semi final on yeah. Saturday. Nice. Um, Exeter have had a good like run. They've won a couple of times. Um, so, yeah. Is it London Broncos, wherever it was? Uh, oh, that's Rugby League. Rugby league. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wrong rugby, mate. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and when you're talking about the highs and that elation, because I mean, that sounds, I can't even imagine what that feels like, but it must must be incredible. I think we've talked about this. When you are experiencing and you're playing every Saturday and it's going well, you've, you know, winning games, the crowd elation, you're having those high moments as well. And once a week or twice a week, whatever it is, you have those real highs. And I think one of the things we spoke about and one of the things that we don't think about unless we're not in that world is what it feels like when you're not in those high moments even if it's just the mundane moments and trying to recreate that high or chase that high and I think in different ways that happens with people whether that's through addiction and drugs but it's just 
chasing that high and trying to get that feeling back. And as a professional sports player, how was that? Were there times where you were chasing the high or is it something that's common in sport where you have that one day a week where it's, this is elation, this is amazing, but the rest of the week I'm not feeling like that. How can I feel like that in different ways? I, th- I think in, in an ideal world, you're sort of like constantly planning your way to get to that at the weekend. You know, you're, mm. the, the week is all about building up towards... Um, trying to recreate that sense of kind of um, that peak moment at the weekend. But obviously, you know, it doesn't always go that way. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think to to try and chase that could, you know, can be problematic. Um, and I think, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if, I think you sort of chase it through trying to, you know, train hard the next week and then recreate it. And it's just that cycle. She keeps going and going and going. Um, but equally, it's not guaranteed because you might not play well, you lose or you get injured or this, that and the other. So if you become over-reliant on, on that hit, then it can be kind of difficult when it's gone. Um, I suppose like retiring and stuff now, it actually became less and less towards the end of my career when I was playing a fair bit in Northampton and stuff. I was getting that hit a lot and then slowly over time, less and less and less and less and less. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of a slow taper off yeah, the high, you know, yeah. it wasn't like, bosh, gone. <laughs> I had a very slow taper down, yeah. Um, Acclimatised. Yeah, it was like, a, yeah, I didn't go cold turkey. I was yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, going to psychology and how you got interested in that, you studied it. And then you did your thesis. Can you share what your thesis was about and what you found from it? Yeah, so I was. It was. It was about sort of emotional well-being in in professional rugby or in professional sport. So it was like a series of interviews with with um, with players, and it was all around the main challenges that people face as professional sports people. So I talked about a lot of them, but the three main things that came out were selection. So. Um, the kind of am I in the team am I out the team but equally even those guys that are in the team regularly also have selection going on at international level am I in the England team and so it's, everyone's got it going on at some level um, even the top players or Lions or in, you know international yeah. stuff so selection's a massive thing um, injury is is another huge challenge and then the, the th- kind of the the training week the boredom of it the the same repetitive nature of it they were the three main challenges that that players faced and then it was all about like how do you deal with those challenges um and most of people's responses were about um like relation well firstly relationships i'll speak to my my dad or i go home and sp- like sp- speak to my partner or um you know play with my kids and i forget about it or uh, I speak to a teammate or a coach. So it was all about like how important relationships are in dealing with the ups and downs of professional sport. And then the second part was the personal um, identity. So a lot of guys would be like, well, if if I face challenges in rugby, right, I'm going to go and focus on a business interest I've got. I've got a hobby. I play the guitar, so I'm going to go and do that. So that's when I mentioned at the start, you've got this professional identity as a professional rugby player. You have this relational identity as a father, a son, a brother, mm. a boyfriend, a husband, or whatever. And then you have this personal identity, me as an individual, like, what do I want? What do I like? What drives me? So in so to put that together, it's kind of like, um, this is a really, you're in a really challenging profession. But if you have a flourishing relational and personal life, um, then if this doesn't go so well, you'll have you'll still maintain your well-being, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, whereas me, I had none of this, none of this. I was all here. So any fluctuation in this, my whole, I could feel my whole sense of self being like on the waves of how rugby was going. Uh, it was all I was, you know. Um, and so, try again, it comes back to the work now, trying to get them to understand and develop how important this stuff is, the relational um, and then how important having a, a, a real personal sense of who you are and, and what you're about is to your, to your success and your, your well-being, yeah. yeah. I think that's really important because 
what you're saying about the emotional well-being actually makes you a better player as well. Like the neurally, you know, the, rugby is one of those games you, you've got to use your brain. And if you've got a healthy brain, like mentally and emotionally, that will help you make quicker decisions. I think someone we spoke to recently as well was talking about that, Kevin, about how you, you need a healthy mind. It just starts on the, doesn't it? It starts on the mind. Mm. Then it goes mm. to then. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And like, I always think the ultimate for me is, is for players to go on the, pit, on the pitch with a clear mind. Mm. Not f- thoughts of, oh God, I'm, I'm, do I know what I'm doing? Um, worrying about this, that, and the other, clear mind so that when they need to use it, it's there for them. You know, like if they need to make a, a decision or see something clearly, it's not tainted with or lost in all this mm-hmm. worry. Um, and emotionally, I want them to feel confident and full of belief and, you know, excited about being involved in the game and immersed in the game rather than feeling anxious. And I suppose nerves is normal. But you know, trying to optimize their mind, like you say, mind and emotion, alongside being physically strong, fit, agile, quick. You know, we know how to optimize that. Yeah, yeah. you know, Physical that's stuff's easy, yeah. Well, we know how to do that. Okay, well, how do we optimize their emotional life and their mental life? Because mm-hmm. when that person steps on the pitch, that's when you get peak performance. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, where does an appreciative inquiry come into? How do you know about that? <laughs> this is the cheeky question he must have been talking about no it's not a cheeky question yeah why not that's yeah that's a that's a that's something i'm really interested in I yeah know, i know you're that's yeah why yeah I yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. About it. um look at you he's getting up blushing no nah, no nah, that's <laughs> mate that's took me by surprise that like so yeah that that's um it's it's kind of like uh so I guess the idea is um, it's about inquiring into what's good. Yes. Um, because we're, we're, so the idea of like for, for a long time or psychology has been very focused on fixing what's bad, pathology, mm-hmm. anxiety, depression, yeah. whereas actually it takes less focus on, okay, what's good, what's positive. So whether I'm working with the player, appreciative inquiry with the player would be, Okay, like what you like when you're at your best. Yeah. What are your unique yeah. sort of gifts, talents? What are your strengths? And then working to um, cultivate, maximize Sounds good. those, yeah. rather than go right. What are you what are you bad at? Mm. Right. We need to, we need to make you better at this. You're not very good at this. You're not very good. At... And then it's it's like that's all tainted with this emotion of I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. broken. I'm I need fixing. Rather than a okay, I accept that I'm limited in some ways, but okay, what am I gonna what am I going to be good at? What am I going to excel at? What 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 have I got to add and offer to this game? And then that's tainted with emotions of hope and like mm. optimism and okay, yeah. I'm going to get stuck into this and I've got something to offer and it it brings them to life then and that, rather than this, okay, I'm going to sit down and go through all your weaknesses and we're going to get a plan. To, you know, like it just it's dead. Like whereas yeah, this yeah. stuff is is like all right, cool. So yeah. kind of just like five section to this appreciative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think number three was poetic. And I sat there and I'm thinking, how do you with it poetic to rugby? Like, what's that? What's that about? What, what do you mean? Like the... I think there's five sections to the um, appreciative inquiry. Yeah, okay. And number three was poetic something. Okay. Yeah. I oh, like maybe like, yeah. yeah. I, maybe I'm not, not hot enough on the theory oh, here, yeah, man. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. He's really done his homework, man. He hasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I, I love I love the approach. It was interesting, though. That yeah, yeah. It was really interesting. I, I love the approach, and I think I think I, I might know what what you mean. But I think it, what it talks yeah, about is like too, don't worry, we'll get you back. <laughs> book, right? Yeah, yeah. After you finish writing your book, by the yeah. Way, yeah. But I, th- I think it might have been touching on like the importance of narrative and language yeah, and words yeah, and yeah, these types yeah, of things. Yeah. So like, um, again, what what stories is that player telling mm-hmm. telling themselves about themselves? So like. Absolutely what stories that play a living. So is they, are so they living? A, yeah. So are they living a story of yeah. I've got, I'm broken. I need fixing or I've got stuff to offer and add here in this game. Which one do you want on the pitch? Mm. Like I, I'm taking this guy who, who yeah. stood on the side of, or, or, or girl, you know, who stood on the side <laughs> of the pitch going, I can't wait to get on. Cause I've got this, this, this. Yeah. And everyone's got limitations and weaknesses. They do. 
but I'd much rather they were focused on this and, and putting their energy into maximising this than fretting and worrying about this side, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. And it's actually kind of a lot of the conversations I've been having recently around, you know, because we're in the men's mental health space mm-hmm. and we encourage open and honest conversations. And often that is about how we're feeling, sometimes we're feeling down. But I think it's also really important to have these kind of conversations as well and the gratefulness and, you know, for what you do have, I think is really important. So hearing that that's a big part of what you practice and and in your role now, to me, it's really interesting because it's something that I've been, it's been in my mind for a while, this thing of, okay, it's good to talk about our feelings and to share these things. And that's super important for our emotional well-being. But that other part as well about, you know, knowing what we're good at, being happy or grateful for the things in our life that we are, yeah. we can be happy and grateful about. That is really important to emotional well-being mm. as well. Mm. And it kind of feels like having both is what you need in your life. So I think I, I hadn't really thought of, and good homework, Manny. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it Tom like that. Tom, yeah. Tom Gies had done his homework. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And do players respond well to it is it something like you're saying because they do get excited about it yeah yeah I feel like it I'm starting to build like I've started to work with certain players over a period of time now and I have seen positive change and I have seen growth and I've also you know lived that for myself and it it does come from my studies and Mm -hmm. the type of psychology I've been studying that type of thing um, which very is much more focused on the what's working well Mm -hmm. and you know it's not like psychology is not just about fixing the broken Mm -hmm. um there's so much more to it than that there's so much more to it than that and you know for a long time the discipline has been focused on you know really ill health and obviously we want people to get help if they're depressed or suicidal or addicted like of course we want to understand Mm -hmm. and help people but there's so much more to it than that. Like yeah. what if someone just feels stuck or, or what if someone's at plus six out of 10? What, what, what's more like, yeah, yeah. and, and ultimately you want players to be, it's, if we were taking physical health, for example, we wouldn't just make people train when they were like, you know, about to keel oh, over yeah. unfit. Yeah. We want them like at the absolute peak of their powers, yeah. you know, physically. So, trying to have the same approach mentally and emotionally, like properly pushing the, the like possibilities of how f- well they can function yeah. um, to aid performance, but also their well-being and their life as well. So, so do you remember uh, asking, like, because we work in the men's space, you know, we hear a lot of stories, COVID has not helped a lot of people mentally. Um, what, was that, what was that like in your field? How was the young chaps or how was your work relations during the old COVID times? Yeah, it was, it was, um, well, we, we, everything shut down because obviously, Mm. um, like training shut down everything. It was difficult to be like thrown back on yourself and having to, to deal with that. And, um, yeah, I mean, I was still playing at the time, um, and just kind of training and I was actually writing my thesis. So I actually was okay. (laughs) Um, in terms of like, you know, getting through that. Um, but yeah, I think definitely highlighted and brought to the surface a lot of things people might have been um distracting themselves from um emotionally and mentally and i think there is a lot of it going on i think people are um you know it's testing times definitely very testing the frequency yeah. is changing a lot so yeah yeah, yeah. so i was going to say you've obviously been through moments where there's been a lot of pressure in your life around selection and, and different games and a lot of these the youngsters that are coming into the game and making that step from youngster to squad player and taking that next level up. What is, in terms of dealing with the pressure and having to make these sacrifices, what what do you think is the best advice or what is kind of the best advice that you give people? I think the re- relationships are key like to have supportive nurturing and positive relationships in your life mm. um is fundamental to your development your health your well-being um and not everyone's fortunate enough to have those but 
you know, if, if there's even like, um, you know, say my relationship, my therapist, my supervisor, like my, you know, like other professional relationships, friends, like t- trying to make sure that you're relationally mm-hmm. solid. And, and there's a, like one of the, one of the huge findings in psychology research is like how important relationships are to your health and well being. Like that's, that's really well founded, robust finding from mm-hmm. like, you know, from, from psychology. So, um, yeah, I think trying to figure out a way of working on that and investing in relationships is so important. Um, and again, a lot of my sufferings come when I've had to do it, try to do it without that and on my own. So, um, slowly learning how to, to do that successfully. Yeah. Amazing. I think that is a, a good place to, to end on and to finish. So thank you so much, Callum, for coming here, being so open and honest uh, in talking about the game, but also about your personal story and, and what happened to you as well. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manny Geese. Doing your homework, asking some amazing yeah, questions. Question. Yeah, yeah, big questions. Well, um, I hope you can write a book one day so we can write a ramble part two because I really think what you're doing is great. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I think it's, yeah, amazing that, that all that you've learned, you're kind of now passing on to... Yeah. I think it's amazing what you're doing and um, I think it will help those players immensely. Just anyone to manage if you sometimes, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. that last thing you said about relationships, yeah. I was like, that's that's for everyone. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is, yeah, yeah well, hopefully, that yeah. Is for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for listening or watching if you're watching. Uh, don't remember to subscribe to our YouTube. You can check out what we're doing on Instagram at yogeezers and also yogeezers.com. But for now, take it easy. Today's a day. Today's a day.